what we began a, a, a few weeks ago, um, what my idea was, is to talk about lineage and um, every four weeks to uh, uh, add to the discussion of lineage. So I we want to continue that this evening. I was unable to uh, make one session, so uh, we'll talk about lineage again next week too, just to kind of get back in sequence. But uh, uh, I'll, hopefully that'll work out well. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking about this uh, be before I get into the the notes that I made. Um, uh, I, I have a particular interest in lineage, and I, I, I never really was aware of that before recently. And uh, I still don't know exactly why, um, other than it just feels vital to me. It feels alive. Um, if anybody was here for the first time that we talked about it, you know, I talked about this notion of my parents standing behind me and theirs behind them. And it doesn't take very many generations before there's a th a thousand people be behind me and I've got three adult kids and I have three young grandchildren and um, and into the future and uh, I sort of picture these two cones of time and people that come together right here <laughs> enormous responsibility uh, so there's familial lineage lineage and there's in our in in, in in Zen practice, uh, we very definitely have lineage um, that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about tonight. But, uh, you know, it also occurred to me that, you know, there are other kinds of lineages that are not family and they're not spiritual. Um, I have all kinds of influences on, on me, just keeping it personal here, um, from people I don't know personally. Um, but without them, my life would be really different artists, politicians, musicians, writers, and so forth. So it's a really rich topic for me. Um, I, I, I really like it. You know, it occurs to me, <clears throat> at some point, there was a decision my mom made before I was born uh, that has everything to do with, with my life today. And my dad's dad made a decision at some point that has everything to do with my life today. It's just so interconnected. Uh, um, anyway, let me let me go ahead and get into these notes, and uh, I'm going to talk about Hakuin Yasutani Roshi tonight. And what I don't want these talks to be is just kind of a dry, um, you know. And I'm no scholar, so th there's no risk of that. Um, but a, a dry recitation of biographical data. I, I want there to be something, something more in this. I want to try to. If I can try to bring in a little bit of the teachers that I'm going to talk about that are mostly in our lineage, but I plan to bring in at least one, maybe two that are that are not so directly, but uh, perhaps influenced some of us. So there will be some historical details and some of that background, but I really want to get closer to, uh, in this case, Yasutani Roshi's uh, unique way of teaching and the ways that he taught. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, we have this expression, the, the harmony of unity and diversity. And the other way to say that is the Sangha of Buddha and Dharma. And because of that, we might presume that uh, expressions of Dharma by teachers, one to the other, should, should align. They ought to be, they ought to be real similar. But they're not. You know, because of that diversity, when we really listen closely, no, te no two teachers are alike at all. Each one is unique. Each one has skillful means of their own to help us wake up. Uh, in, my, in my day job, I have the privilege of working with lots and lots of teachers. And this has really come home uh, you know, in the last couple of years at Zen Peacemakers to be true for me. I mean, they are as different as could possibly be. So, um, 
Hakuin Yasutani Roshi. Uh, he was born in Japan in 1885, and he died in 1973 in Japan. And so that's kind of the, I don't want, I don't want to do a lot of dates and stuff and locations. I won't, I don't even know what town he was named in. I could find out. Um, it's not so important to me. He grew up really, really poor. He was adopted by another family when he was, you know, three or four years old. Uh, and at, at five years old, he was sent to a Rinzai temple at five years old. Um, but what I want to talk about tonight was that he was really unique. Um, some of you have heard the, the term, uh, the, the name of a Zen school, Sanbo Kyodan, Sanbo, S-A-N-B-O, Kyodan, K-Y-O-D-A-N. Um, and it was unique, and he had everything to do with founding the school. It, it was unique because it incorporated essential elements of both Soto and Rinzai Zen practice. Very, very generally, uh, Soto practice being really more silent illumination or what we call Shikantaza, broad based awareness of everything. And Rinzai Zen practice being more koan study. Yasutani Roshi had really had everything to do with creating this blend of the two schools, and it is very unique. Um, his teacher, uh, Arata Roshi, was trained in both schools. So Yasutani came by this honestly. He had the influence from his teacher, but he really made it into, uh, uh, you know, its, uh, its, its own school of Zen practice. Uh, Hakuya Taizan Maizumi Roshi, who founded the Zen Center of Los Angeles, was a student of Yasutani. So this way of practicing, which is this blend of these two schools, this blend of these two or really more styles of practice, came together in the United States, in LA, starting in 1967 or so. And Maizumi Roshi is Shishin Roshi's teacher. Shishin Roshi is Kyoto Sensei's teacher. So this blending of these two styles of Zen practice come to us as lineage. There's a, um, and I've read this story enough times that I, I believe it, although it, it, it sounds magical to me. Uh, and this is just kind of a, I won't do historical anecdotes, but uh, other than a couple here. Uh, when Yasutani was born, his mother um, had already decided that her next, before he was born, next son would be a priest. And she was given a bead from a rosary by a nun who told her to swallow the bead for a safe child childbirth in Japan, 1885. When Yasutani, and this is how the story goes. Uh, when Yasutani was born, his left hand was tightly clasped around that same bead. And uh, later on, when he was an adult, he said, he said of this story, your life flows out of time much earlier than what begins at your own conception. Your life seeks your parents. He began his uh, serious Zen training when, when he was 40 years old, uh, which is older than many people on in this session this evening. Um, so if you think it's too late, uh, it's not. <laughs> it's never too late. Um, and again, Harada Roshi was his teacher, who was a Soto master, but who had also studied under both Soto and Rinzai teachers. Uh, very soon, uh, Yasutani developed kind of a poor opinion of the Soto Zen structure and organization and school in Japan. And he thought it had become kind of methodical and ritualistic, kind of stiff, hierarchical, bureaucratic. Um, and he really felt that, you know, sincere, strong practice and primarily 
realization or lacking in this practice. So he left the Soto sect in 1954 when he was 69 years old. He started Sanbo Kyoto. Sanbo Kyoto translates as the Fellowship of the Three Traders. He started it as an independent school of Zen. This was probably really revolutionary and perhaps even sacrilegious in Japan at the time. Uh, let's see, he was 69, 1885, 15. So this was, you know, yeah, 1954. Um, and thereafter, he focused his efforts mainly on training lay people. There's two or three things I want to really call out, and maybe I'll even repeat them as I go through this, because they trickle down to what we do today, and they have everything to do with how our lineage of, of Zen uh, manifested uh, in the West. So he did, for, for somebody who had such an enormous influence on Zen practice in America and, in, and I would say in Europe as well, he didn't even come to the United States until 1962 when he was 77 years old. He came three years after Suzuki Roshi, who's one of the other huge influences on Zen practice in America. And here's, a, here's an interesting uh, contrast between the two of them uh, that really kind of goes back to what I said earlier about diversity and no two teachers are alike and each has, each really has her or his own um, unique approach to how they help us wake up. Suzuki Roshi was was prone, actually what he did was, he just set himself up in San Francisco and quietly sat doing zazen. And he just waited for people to come. I won't use a baseball movie analogy, but you know, that's what he did. Um, and of course they did, the rest is history. Meanwhile, uh, Yasutani Roshi, in just seven years, crossed the U.S. seven times. He was frenetic. Uh, he was like a Sashin machine. <laughs> he conducted Sashins uh, all over the country, just, you know, just uh, frenetic. He was really, really committed to helping people wake up. And his influence was no less vast than Suzuki's, and it spread really quickly. Uh, and, and as long as we're making this comparison to Suzuki Roshi, there's another uh, another really sharp contrast between these two. Uh, and perhaps this is this is a bit of a contrast between Soto School and Rinzai School. Suzuki Roshi rarely mentioned Kensho, Japanese word really meaning the awakening experience, enlightenment experience. Suzuki Roshi rarely mentioned it. Yasutani, uh, on the other hand, was singularly focused on it. His sashins were known for, and, and you know, there was some criticism of this. They were really known for being Kensho pressure cookers. He really drove people. To, you know, to, to experience the unity, oneness, the Buddha nature. He felt that Kensho was the beginning of our practice. And every session expected at least one or two people to have that experience. And uh, I understand often that was the case, they did. And he came by this, I think, rightfully. His teacher, Harada Roshi, had that same kind of emphasis on early Kensho. So, so far, uh, there's, we, we've pointed to, to one thing that was really unique um, in the context of Zen practice as it was 
carried out in Japan, and that was the focus on, on lay practitioners, householders, as we might say. Most everybody else uh, in Japan was, were monastics. Um, another unique thing that came from Harada Roshi down through Yasutani, down through Maizumi Roshi, and I'll, I'll just say what's true, down to our friend Lisa Gakyo, who is sitting here tonight, um, is they offered introductory le lectures that aimed to spell out as much as possible how to practice, you know, forms, etc. And that was just not done. Um, from what now, I you know I never practiced in Japan. Um, but from what I understand, it was really common for new people to be shown where to sit, point to your zafu, sit there, see you later. <laughs> and, and you kind of you kind of get to cook in your own confusion and discomfort and doubt. And that's part of entering the practice. Are you committed to this? How committed are you? <laughs> Do what everybody else does. That was really common. And um, Harada Roshi and then Yasutani, who we're talking about tonight, um, always, from what I understand, always included um, these introductory lectures or comments. So, uh, some of what I'm, uh, let me just take a, take a left turn here for a second. Uh, some of what I'm drawing from is this book, which many of us have, um, published in 1965. And, uh, for, you know, for a lot of us, you know, Americans and people, kids at the time, it was our first real in-depth introduction to Zen practice. It's an extraordinary extraordinary book and um, it offers uh, details that you really don't find anywhere else um, and at the same time uh, it offers uh, ample opportunities to uh, get confused and get the wrong idea in terms of expecting this that or the other thing to happen or thinking that you're not doing it right or, or whatever else there's, you know, I've had my challenges with this book. I've had to put it down and walk away from it for a long time, but it's been wonderful to go back to it. Yasutani Roshi had a real appreciation for lay practice. Again, he didn't really get started until he was 40. And by then he had five kids and he'd been a school teacher for a long time and he was married. Um, so we have that today. Um, we have that today. We, we, we've mentioned this before, uh, and I, I won't speak about Europe because I, I know less about Zen in Europe, but certainly in, in American Zen, you know, some of the things that really characterize how it has developed here are that it is a lay practice, that there are as many women included is, was a real change from Japan. Uh, that Americans have something of a sense of justice <laughs> and and democracy, which uh, was a real change from Japan and expectations of uh, certain kinds of behavior by their teachers. And there are uh, you know, you know, uh, dramatic stories of a number of big Zen centers in the United States sort of exploding because of uh, that uh, commitment to democracy uh, and our commitment to social action uh, and, uh, and engagement, uh, which is fairly unique and new here in the West. Um, so anyway, I, I'll, I, I mentioned this book and uh, uh, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, Yasutani Roshi's introductory lectures are in the very beginning of the book. And uh, he does something that I'm, I'm going to re read from here uh, before I end. Uh, he, he includes 
transcriptions of private interview discussions with his students, doksan, which you know we're we're mostly aware of and and and, and are very careful about. That's that is private. We don't we don't much talk about that. Um, there was no place else to find that kind of information when this book came out, and to to a large extent since, really. Um, so I, I recommend this book. This was really my this book was my first Zen teacher. Uh, I taught myself to sit following Yasutani's introductory instructions. So although his style was you know, and if you do read this, or if you have read this, some of, I know many of you have, his style was very fierce. Um, a lot of shouting and exhorting students to try harder and pushing and shoving and use of the kisaku. And, uh, you know, there are stories of uh, students, you know, in session uh, up all night out in, out in the garden, you know, <laughs> shouting moo at the sky. Um, Although that, those characteristics really fit him, uh, in these transcriptions, what you hear is a real gentleness and a caring and a love for his students that balance the vigor. He really sincerely, with all of his, you know, everything he had, wanted us to wake up. Um, so um, if, if, if you'd indulge me, uh, I, I just picked a couple of relatively short uh, conversations. And because of the, because of his unique blending of Soto and Rinzai, I, I picked one um, that was really more of a Soto kind of a conversation. It's a Shikantaza conversation and another that is uh, a, a koan practice interview. And of course, in the book, he doesn't, nobody names the people. It's just, uh, uh, they, they're anonymous. And the student says, I'm doing shikantaza. And Roshi says, I noticed you last night sitting with your hands clenched in your lap and straining very hard. In shikantaza, it is, necess it is unnecessary to strain. The student says, everybody around me was straining and pushing, so I thought I should too. Well, most of them are novices working on their first koan. So if they do not strain, whatever concentrative strength they develop dissipates quickly. So they must struggle constantly to maintain it. It is like learning to write the Chinese ideograms. At first, you have to bear down with force as you painfully form the characters. But later, when you have learned how to make them, you can, of course, write effortlessly. You are experienced at Zazen, so you need not strain yourself. The student says, I must admit, there are times when my concentration is strong without forcing myself. But for Satori, isn't it necessary to do Zazen forcefully? Roshi says, Shikantaza is practiced in the faith that such Zazen is itself already the actualization of your pure Buddha nature. So it is unnecessary to strive self-consciously for Satori. And here we're using the words Satori and Kensho and awakening interchangeably. You must sit with a mind which is alert and at the same time unhurried and composed. This mind must be like a well-tuned piano string, taut but not over tight. Also remember that in a session, you are helped by everyone else through this communal sitting, so you need not strain yourself. Last night, I observed you laughing and crying. Did you experience anything unusual? The student says, I was absolutely without will. I felt as though I had crushed everything. Nothing remained, and I was joyous. Well, tell me, have you ever had anxieties about death? No, I have not, Roshi asks. People who are troubled by the thought of death often have their anxieties relieved 
by an experience like yours. Did your way of looking at things change at all? The student said, no, after it was over, I felt no different, I regret to say. Did the feeling of opposition, of yourself standing against the external world, disappear at all, even momentarily? Well, my feeling was only one of tremendous elation because I felt that everything had been reduced to nothing. After that, did your former state of mind return? The student said yes. And Roshi concludes the, the interview with, all right, just sit diligently without straining yourself. Some of us are doing this kind of shikantaza practice. On, uh, I don't know if that's illuminating at all. The second uh, interchange is much, uh, much shorter. And it's with the student who's doing koan practice. The student says, my koan is, from where you are, stop the distant boat moving across the water. Roshi says, demonstrate your understanding of the spirit of it. And they don't tell us what this is, but the student demonstrates that it's good, but try it this way. And Roshi demonstrates another expression of this koan and asks, do you understand the true spirit of this? The student says, yes, the boat and I are not two. Roshi says, that is right. When you become one with the boat, it ceases to be a problem for you. The same is true of your daily life. If you don't separate yourself from the circumstances of your life, you live without anxiety. In summer, you adapt yourself to heat. In winter, to cold. If you are rich, you live the life of a rich man. If you are poor, you live with your poverty. Were you to go to heaven, you would be an angel. Were you to fall into hell, you would become a devil. In Japan, you live like a Japanese. In Canada, like a Canadian. Lived this way, life isn't a problem. Animals have this adaptability to a high degree. Human beings also have it, but because they imagine that they are this or that, because they fashion notions and ideas of what they ought to be or how they ought to live, they're constantly at war with their environment and with themselves. The purpose of this column then is to teach you how to be at one with every aspect of your life. We only have a short time to, to touch on this teacher and then I hope I was, uh, I don't know. I, I hope I was successful in bringing in a little bit more about birth date, death date, <laughs> significant life achievements, and, and a little bit of the flavor of how he taught. Oh I, oh, I had one more thing I wanted to show you, too. Where is it? Um, I love this picture of him. Um, let's see. Can I share a screen? Uh, he was very tall for a Japanese man, and he had enormous ears. And the description of him was his ears stuck out like teacups. When we used to sit at uh, Kyoto Sensei's house uh, in the ante room or the foyer outside the Zendo, there are pictures of teachers in the lineage, and, and his is on the wall. So, so thank you. Uh, you know, I, I hope there was something in there for you. And uh, if nothing else, I really encourage uh, 
taking a look at this book. It's a gem. And um, um, with that, I'll say I appreciate you paying attention and listening.